Long before bluegrass or bourbon were known around the world, before horses were off to the races, even back before Kentucky ever became Kentucky, wide open fields of what they called the bear grass grew as far as the eye could see. But it wasn't just bears that roamed that fresh wilderness. Folks settled in, sturdy souls with stout hearts and strong spirits. While Daniel Boone was busy carving his initials in a beargrass tree, his baby brother Squire was preaching to a bunch of pioneers down at the beargrass creek. In fact, it didn't take long before those very people would establish the first church in this neck of the woods. Folks around the world would learn to call that wider frontier land Kentucky. But we just call it home. Soon, pioneers discovered it was true that here the grass was a little bluer and a rugged river town took shape where the Ohio River met the Beargrass Creek. Today, people worldwide come together to celebrate a place where we welcome refugees and royalty alike. Some people call it Louisville, and still others even call it Louisville. But no matter what they may call it, we just call it home. In time, that simple pioneer faith, born on the Kentucky frontier, grew up as the Christian Church Disciples of Christ, all about bringing different folks together, founded not on creeds or tests of faith, but a simple call to live out our lives more like the one who showed us what love is all about. Times have changed since then, and God knows we've certainly changed as well. It may not just be a church in the bear grass anymore, but every weekend down on Shelbyville Road in the heart of St. Matthews, the community comes together from all around. 45 zip codes, 11 counties, two states, and beyond for a farmer's market on Saturday, right back on Sunday for worship, and serving the community seven days a week. We're not perfect people, and we're not the perfect church, but we're all people on a journey towards the way of Jesus. Here, all are welcome. With open hearts and open minds, we unite as folks of every kind, color, orientation, generation, and occupation. Some spiritual and some seekers, some conservative, some progressive, and some in between. But we're proud to claim each other as family because we believe that no matter what divides us in this fragmented world, all of us are invited to share the bread and cup at the table together. Some people call it Beargrass Christian Church, but we just call it home. Beargrass has always been a place of belonging and connection for us, especially along our faith journey. It is a space that nurtures conversation, fellowship, fun, clearly. Um, and it's always been a place that we can come as our authentic selves and be immediately be embraced by love. And it's awesome to see that love being extended to our little ones. As a parent, it's a great feeling knowing that you found a place where your children can thrive and where they'll have every opportunity to explore their faith. And this is why we call Beargrass home. Welcome to Beargrass Christian Church, a place called home. We gather together every Sunday here on Shelbyville Road in the heart of St. Matthews. And we invite you to join us during this next half hour to get to know us a little better as we celebrate the love of Jesus Christ. Oh 
Good morning to our WHAS family. Wherever you are this morning across the greater Louisville area, we are so glad that you are with us as we broadcast here from Beargrass Christian Church right in the heart of St. Matthew's. It seems like this summer here in Louisville is hotter than ever towards the end. But just be glad that you were not around back in the summer of 1923. It was a scorcher. There was this 15-year-old farm boy in that hot summer who found himself at a church revival meeting in this tiny white frame building, no air conditioning. It was called First Christian Church of Johnson City, Texas. One of just three churches in this small town. But this boy's devoutly Baptist family attended the other church down the road. So it uh, became a real shock when the boy went to a revival at the Disciples of Christ Church. And so intrigued by their open-mindedness, he came up in front of the entire church. And that very day, he was baptized outside below this grove of pecan trees. Months went by uh, before this 15-year-old kid even bothered to tell his Baptist family that he had just joined a Disciples of Christ church. Only nine months earlier, halfway across the country, there was another Disciples of Christ church where the minister went by the name of Reverend Ben Cleaver. Uh, Reverend Cleaver believed that kids really needed to wait until their teenage years to be baptized, and he would not baptize anyone until they were at least 13. But there was this one 11-year-old little boy there at First Christian Church of Dixon, Illinois, who really wanted to be baptized, even though he was too young, according to Reverend Cleaver's rules. But the boy didn't give up. Finally, Reverend Cleaver had to give in. Uh, the 11-year-old convinced this minister to baptize him much younger than the rest of his peers, which the minister agreed to do mostly because the boy's mother was an elder in the disciples' church. Of course, unheard of for a woman in the 1920s and most other denominations. And that boy went on to lead the Easter sunrise service for the whole church at just 15 years old. He went on to attend a Disciples of Christ College. Now, why do I bore you with these seemingly disconnected stories from two random boys a century ago baptized in disciples of Christ churches like ours? Well, I share those stories because I think you might have heard of those boys. Their names were Lyndon B. Johnson and Ronald Reagan. Now, if I were to use all the rest of the time in the message to make a list of all the things that these two Democratic and Republican presidents agreed on, you'd probably be thrilled because this would be the shortest sermon you've ever heard. It's a short list of things they agree on. Each of these men, while polar opposites on the political spectrum, they both found this welcoming home in our denomination, the Christian Church, Disciples of Christ. In fact, when they both grew up to be president, each had their inaugural worship service at their inauguration, the same Disciples Church in Washington, D.C. So how can it be these two iconic presidents so vastly different from one another could possibly find a home in the same denomination Sunday after Sunday? I think the answer is because Disciples of Christ is a movement founded right here in Kentucky among the first uniquely American religious movements birthed in those tender years when our country was in its infancy. They're imbued with this frontier spirit of freedom and friendliness where all are welcome. As Disciples of Christ, we have always from the beginning, found our greatest hope for the church. And that profound saying, you, you might have heard it before, in essentials, unity. In non-essentials, liberty. In all things, love. And we got to admit, uh, surely we got to recognize that these words are not what we always already are. It's not a declaration of what we've always done, and it is most assuredly not 
the predestined outcome of where we shall inevitably arrive without hard work. No, it is a standard for which we always strive. In fact, uh, my mother-in-law uh, says that when it comes to church in particular, that perhaps we should add a fourth line to that statement that says, in agreement, astonishment. No, we don't always agree. But our solemn oath to one another is to always agree to listen to each other, to be earnestly open, to learn from each other's experiences, our differences, and the ways that God is still speaking to each of us in our world today. With an election on the horizon, think about how quick one side is to blame the other for all the problems we face. I mean, it's become all too easy to make a whole career out of villainizing the other side of the aisle because it's easier to get elected that way than it is to actually work together. The truth is, Jesus has already offered us a different path. When we disagree, don't hold on to it for yourself. Don't walk away. Jesus says this, if another member of the community wrongs you, here it is, Jesus gives us this four-point plan for how to deal with disagreements when they come up. One, go and find that person and talk about it face-to-face. Because the truth is, it's hard to demonize someone when you're staring them in the eye. Now, Jesus doesn't stop there because of all things that Jesus is, Jesus is not naive. He knows that that will not always work. And so he gives us another option. After you've done that one, if that doesn't work, then you move on to the next step, number two. Jesus says, get a couple of trusted people who can come with you to talk about it, to help reconcile the situation. Talk it out together. And those are not your wingmen just to to sit there and take your side, defend you no matter what. No, other people being there are there to remind both sides that when there's disagreement, you are not the only person in the world. Because every conflict, every single conflict between two people, I'm convinced it rarely stays between those two people, doesn't it? It has this ripple effect on all sorts of people, the community around you, And so you get the community together. And of course, Jesus knows that will not always work either. So Jesus offers us now a third step. Bring the matter before the community. You know what he's telling us there? He's telling us our communities have to be worth that. That we ought to strive so earnestly to build our communities as the kind of safe and trusted places that even those who have betrayed someone else, even those who have spat in the face of a sister or brother, a sibling, cannot help but come in and be moved by the power of a community that is always, always based on unconditional love. But even that, fail sometimes. Even that won't always work. And so Jesus offers us one last piece of advice. When even the community won't live up to that best self, if you've tried all those other things earnestly and good faith, and you still have not found reconciliation, if you haven't gotten anywhere, Jesus says to try one more thing. Here we are, number four. If the offender refuses to listen even to the whole community, Let such a one be to you as a Gentile and a tax collector. Ouch. (laughs) Sounds sounds pretty dang harsh, doesn't it? I don't know about you. I don't really want to be labeled a Gentile and a tax collector. Of course, I don't mean to offend anyone who happens to work at the IRS. 
But it's really difficult to imagine uh, those words, those confrontational words, leaving the lips of the same Jesus, the same Jesus, who even as he was dying, forgave the very people who had nailed him to a cross. Jesus saves this step for last, this final resort, because he knows, well, it's the hardest one to do. On the face of things, that that step four, it kind of seems like the fun option. It's the one that we usually skip to. Just shut them out. Politicians let us down, just turn off the TV, flip the channel. The minister preached something you didn't agree with. Just give up on going to church altogether. Friend says something bad about you behind your back. Just maybe they'll learn a thing or two when we start screening their phone calls or writing about them on Facebook. It's hard. In this day, when we have more choices and options than ever before in the history of the world, whether we're talking about coffee or congregations, it has never been easier to just walk away from someone or something you don't like, which means it has never been harder to get all this stuff right, to truly follow what Jesus invites us to be part of to do what he's asking us here in the scripture. And now, in the midst of all that, we've got Matthew 18 in our back pocket. Jesus says, okay, you tax collector, just, just get away from me. I'll lay be that. But then again, what was it that Jesus did with Gentiles and with tax collectors? Somewhere in that book, I read a story that Jesus actually risked everything, every other relationship that he had to sit down with the tax collector. His name was Zacchaeus. He wanted to try to understand him, came into his home while all the other people were outside grumbling, complaining, Jesus, how could you eat with someone like that, a sinner? But Jesus, in the face of it, showed Zacchaeus what it means to love unconditionally. In fact, it was precisely the outsiders, the tax collectors, the sinners, the downtrodden, with whom Jesus spends most of his time. Let such a one be to you as a Gentile and a tax collector. That does not mean we cut somebody off from our life if we don't like them. It means that's the moment to step up, to lean in, to risk everything in this world for the sake of reconciliation. Because it's exactly in that act of reconciliation that we discover God is working in our midst. That God was even more powerful than we ever imagined, we ever thought God could be. And that's why Matthew ends this difficult passage with one of those mysterious parts of the scripture. Jesus says, truly I tell you, if two of you agree on earth about anything you ask, it'll be done by my Father in heaven. For where two or three are gathered in my name, I am there among them. Another way of saying that, in other words, is it's nothing short of a miracle any time one person agrees with another person. But for a whole church, a whole country, a whole nation to all agree about something, that it's too much to even ask for. And in the end, perhaps to all be of one mind, maybe it's not even the goal. Because I heard it said once that when all hearts are one, nothing else has to be. And that's what this whole thing that we call the Christian church, Disciples of Christ, is all about. It's what Lyndon Johnson and Ronald Reagan learned growing up in our denomination that we are in 
the business of reconciliation. That is why we exist. That is our purpose. Bringing people together who are willing to risk everything for the sake of unity. We commit ourselves that when you come in our doors, it is not the color of your skin, what you believe in, your political party, who you love. None of us earns a seat at the table because of any of those things. But we all have a place here for one simple reason. Because you are a beloved child of God. Surely that's something we can all agree about. Amen. As a part of the Christian Church Disciples of Christ, we at Beargrass often refer to this table as the table of love. We affirm that it is God's table and not ours. And as such, we know that all are invited to come to the table. And as we come to the table, we are invited, just like Jesus' disciples all those years ago, to remember. Jesus invites us to remember his life and death and resurrection to remember his life and love that we may do our best to emulate that life and to remember his death and resurrection so that no matter what we are facing, we have hope that in the midst of death, in the midst of endings, there is hope for new life and new beginnings. So I hope that whatever you're going through today, that you experience the gifts of God, God's gifts of love, joy, hope, and peace known most fully here at the table. Will you pray with me? God, we give you thanks for your gifts of love and hope and peace and joy and pray that as we partake in the bread of life and the cup of hope and salvation that we may experience and know these gifts today and share them in our world. Amen. We give thanks that on the night that Jesus was to be betrayed, he took bread, blessed and broken and said, this is my body given for you as often as you do this, do this in remembrance of me. Likewise, he took the cup, gave thanks and said, this is the cup of the new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. As often as you do this, do this in remembrance of me. Friends, you are invited to share in this meal and we pray that you experience God's gifts of love and hope. As disciples, the central part of our worship experience is the celebration of communion. And though you may not be able to worship in person with us today, we want you to know that you are now a treasured part of our worshiping community. And so we invite you to gather communion elements convenient to you and participate with us this morning. We celebrate that this table is a table that unites us and connects us across miles, across ideas, across any number of barriers. And ultimately, we hope that you know that you are loved and accepted here at the table. We've seen it too many times before. A lot of churches come on TV just to ask for money. But the good people at Beargrass Christian Church have already made today's program possible. 
So instead, we're asking something different. If you've been moved by something you've heard or seen on today's program, join us in what we're calling a reverse offering, featuring an incredible mission partner across Louisville that's doing great work right here in our community. Today, we're sending a gift and we invite you to join us in supporting this wonderful organization that we invite you to learn more about this morning. Let's take a listen. The World Health Organization has estimated that one out of every three people in the world does not have access to safe, clean water, and children are affected disproportionately by contaminated water. WaterStep is a local nonprofit that lives by the motto, save lives with safe water. From right here in Louisville to communities across the globe, WaterStep provides clean water solutions, whether as far away as East Africa or to disaster areas close to home like Mayfield, Kentucky. WaterStep provides sanitation equipment vital for immediate impact, along with the training and health education essential for long-term success. This amazing nonprofit can make all of Louisville proud as they turn thirst into hope around the world. Through this month's reverse offering, Beargrass is proud to send a donation to WaterStep this morning, and we'd like to invite you to join us in supporting these life-saving projects by adding your own donation or finding out ways to volunteer at waterstep.org. Thanks for joining us this morning. Your presence has been such a blessing. We'd love to see you next Sunday. We gather every week for worship in the heart of St. Matthew's at Beargrass Christian Church right on Shelbyville Road. Each week we meet for worship at 9 o'clock and 11 o'clock. And you can learn more about our worship services at www.beargrass.org. We will also find links to our Facebook or YouTube weekly live stream broadcast as well. One of the best things about this community is that together we worship with hope, we grow with love, and we serve with a passion for justice. So this morning, we want to conclude our time together by focusing on one of the ways that Beargrass lives out our mission all across Louisville in this city that we are so proud to call home. On the Beargrass Christian Church campus, behind the sanctuary and in the back of the parking lot, there's an old garage full of busted bikes and bike parts that builds a lot of goodwill and grace in Louisville. It may not look like much, but those pedals have a lot of power. 